science in pajama jamas. All right, so today we're going to talk about cell respiration. Now, cellular respiration is a reaction that takes place in the mitochondria of cells in order to create energy that will power all of the activities of the cell. Now, <clears throat> when we say it creates energy, it's actually taking energy from glucose. So when we eat, we take in food, we digest it, we actually get glucose. That's one of the molecules that we get from our food. It's a type of carbohydrate, a simple carbohydrate. And what happens is it gets sent to our mitochondria where the mitochondria is going to break the bonds of the glucose. <clears throat> Sorry. When it breaks those bonds, energy is released from those bonds and that energy is going to be trapped and stored in a molecule called ATP. Now, we'll talk briefly about that before we discuss cell respiration. So, first we start off with something called ADP. And that stands for adenosine diphosphate, so two phosphates. So we have the adenosine, and it has two phosphates hanging off the end of it. Now what happens is when glucose is broken, the mitochondria is actually going to form another bond with the ADP, and a third phosphate. And that molecule becomes ATP, adenosine tri triphosphate. This adenosine triphosphate will go out to the different parts of the cell, and how it provides energy is this bond right here. Remember, we store the energy in that bond. So what happens is that bond gets broken, the energy is released to whichever organelle needs it, and then it's back to being adenosine diphosphate plus this lonely phosphate. They go back to the mitochondria, they get charged up again, meaning a new bond is formed, storing more energy there, and then they can go out to the cell and release it with another organelle. Kind of like a rechargeable battery. <clears throat> now first, let's talk about the structure of the mitochondria. The mighty mitochondria. Now that's actually plural. Mitochondrion is the singular. So what it is, we got this organelle. Kind of looks like. Kind of like that. Now the different parts of it, we have the outer membrane. And then we have our inner membrane. Well, The inside of the mitochondria is filled with this particular kind of gel-like liquid, which we call the mitochondrial matrix, or just the matrix. Not to be confused with the Oceano Reeves movies. Now you see how the inner membrane forms these folds? We actually call those folds the cristae. All the cristae is, is the folding of the inner membrane. Now the reason why it does that is because it adds a lot more surface area to the inner membrane so that we can run a lot more cell respiration reactions at the same time. By having more area to do it in, we can run more reactions. All right, so that is the mighty mitochondria.
Now cellular respiration has three steps. Most of the reaction occurs in the mitochondria, but the very, very first step, which is called glycolysis, actually occurs in the cytoplasm outside of the mitochondria. So you start off with your glucose, which remember is a six, actually, before we do that, sorry, I forgot to talk to you guys about the reaction, the actual reaction. So what do cells need to run cellular respiration? Well, they have two reactants. They have glucose, which is C6H12O6 plus they have six carbon gas molecules, sorry, oxygen gas molecules. And those are our two reactants. So one glucose plus six oxygen will give us six carbon dioxide plus six water plus our energy which is going to be around 36 ATP molecules. So from one glucose molecule, we can get 36 ATP, 36 energy use, units. Now this reaction kind of looks a little bit similar. It should. It's the exact opposite of photosynthesis. In photosynthesis, six carbon dioxide plus six water plus energy, but in the form of sunlight, gave us one glucose plus six oxygen. In cell respiration, one glucose plus six oxygen will give us six carbon dioxide plus six H2O, or water molecules, plus energy in the form of 36 ATP. All right. So that is our reaction. Uh, it's also why a lot of times people will say that um, photosynthesis and cell respiration are opposite reactions because in terms of their reactants and products, they pretty much are just flipped around. But now let's go back to cell respiration. Now we're in glu or gly glycolysis, which occurs in the cytoplasm, and it starts with a glucose molecule, which remember is a six carbon molecule, specifically C6H12O6. Now, what's gonna happen? Again, this is in the cytoplasm. It is going to be broken apart. When it's broken apart, it's gonna create two three carbon molecules. Now these three carbon mo molecules are called pyruvate. In the process of creating these two three carbon molecules, we're also going to create some energy. So we're gonna have some ADP, which is low tagalong phosphate, is gonna actually create ATP. Now when we, again, when we break the bonds, we're, we are releasing energy. So when we break the glucose bonds, we are releasing energy and we're able to make ATP. Not only that, we also do release some electrons and we're going to gather those up as well. We have some electron carriers. We have NAB plus it's going to pick up some of those electrons and become NADH. All right, so those are our electron carriers. Now, the process of glycolysis makes two ATP. Not a whole lot of energy if you're a multicellular organism. Now, if you are a single-celled organism like bacteria, that could be enough to, you know, power your cell. 
but we're not bacteria. We need a lot more energy than that. So these two pyruvate molecules are now going to enter the mitochondria. And this takes us to step two, the Krebs cycle. I'm going to just kind of draw a couple things first and then we're going to talk about them. Again, I am going to explain everything. I'm going to write more stuff on there. I just want to get some things started. I'm going to have that. And I'm going to have that. And that. And that. And that. And that. I should probably do that one more in the middle. All right, so this is the Krebs cycle. Now remember, we're starting off with pyruvate, which is a three carbon molecule. Now we're just gonna follow the first one through, okay? But remember, after glycolysis, we had two pyruvate. We're just gonna look at one for now. The three carbon molecule, Pyruvate. Now what happens is we are going to break the bonds of it again and when we break the bonds we are going to release some energy as well as electrons. We are going to actually collect an electron here NAD plus to become NADH and that's also going to create a waste product. We are going to create carbon dioxide gas as a waste product and it's going to leave the Krebs cycle. It's actually going to leave the entire thing, but ah, I'm going to grab something. So now we have a two carbon molecule. Well, something called coenzyme A is going to bond to it in order to help it with this part right here. Now, when it bonds to it, it helps it to bond to a four carbon molecule that's already in the cycle. So that four carbon molecule is already in the cycle. Coenzyme A helps the two carbon molecule to bond to it, forming, you guessed it, a six carbon molecule. Now, we have this large six carbon molecule, and what we're going to do is a series of breaks or breaking of the bonds. So we're gonna break it and release carbon dioxide gas. That's also going to allow us to collect an electron. And we're left with a five carbon molecule. Well, guess what? Yes, we are going to break it again. And we end up with let's see, carbon dioxide gas and a four carbon molecule. Now at this point we're also going to collect more electrons and we're also going to make some ATP at this stage. Well our four carbon molecule we're going to rearrange that. It is going to help us create some more elect or gather up more electrons. And 
And now we have the four carbon molecule that went into this in the first place that attached to the two carbon molecule with the help of coenzyme A. Now in this process, we made one, two, three carbon dioxide and one ATP. But remember, this is just one of the two pyruvate molecules that we started with. The other pyruvate molecule is also going to go through this. So each pyruvate molecule makes three carbon dioxide molecules. So since they each make three, that means we have a total of six carbon dioxide molecules made. And since each one will result in one ATP being made, that means in total we had two ATP being made. All right, now let's move on to the last part of, yeah, yeah, sorry, the last part of cell respiration, which is step three, and that is the electron transport chain, kind of similar to the one that we saw back in um, photosynthesis. So first let me get my picture drawn. So those are my enzymes and my proteins. All right. So this is the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Down here would be the matrix. And then up here would be the intermembrane space, so the spot, the space between the inner and outer membrane. Now it's called an electron transport chain because, well, just like before, as we saw in our um, photosynthesis reaction, we're going to transport the electrons from one protein to another. So they're going to start down here. And they're actually going to move from one protein to the next and then back down there. Now where they're coming from is, remember we had all of those different molecules collecting the electrons, such as NADH. It's one of those electron carriers, kind of like a taxi, an electron taxi. It drops the electron off, becoming NAD+, plus, as well as, oh, sorry. and then there's, well, we'll get to the hydrogens in a moment, but there are some hydrogens already down here at well, but we'll get to those in a moment. All right, so. The electrons are going to come and be passed all the way from one protein to another until it gets to here. At this point, we're going to take them and add them to some hydrogen ion. We have hydrogen ions and we also have some oxygen. Now once we have two sets of hydrogen ions and two oxygens, then we're going to be able to gather up the electrons and form water. Got to wait for the, pretty much more so for the oxygens to get there. The other hydrogens that are left over from this and as well as from dropping these off, those are going to do something else. We're going to discuss that in a moment. But so far so good? 
I know you guys can't answer me because it's a video, but still. All right. So the electron get, they leave the electron carrier, they move through the proteins, and eventually get added on here to create water. Now the question is, well, why go through all that work of passing through the proteins? It's actually very easy. Remember how in photosynthesis, the movement of the electrons drew the hydrogen ions across the membrane? Guess what's gonna happen again? Yep, as they move, they're going to pull some of these hydrogen ions through to this side of the membrane, to the intermembrane space. So the flow of the electrons pulls the hydrogens through the membrane. And now we start building up a large concentration of them in the intermembrane space. Well, remember what happens when you have a larger concentration on one side of a membrane than the other? The molecules want to go to the less crowded side. They want to flow down their concentration gradient from the higher concentration to the lower concentration. And luckily, we got just the buddy to do that. Here we have our ATP synthase. And what it does, again, like a water wheel, the hydrogens are going to move through it because they want to get away from this crowded high concentration area and come down to here in the matrix where there is less hydrogen ion, so a lower concentration. So they're going to flow through that due to the concentration gradient. And like a water wheel, a water wheel you know, sits in a river and as the water the current pushes it, it turns the wheel, and that wheel is able to generate energy. Well, it's the same idea. As the hydrogens flow through the ATP synthase, it generates energy. And that's going to allow us, the hydrogen goes in there, that is then going to allow us to store that energy by attaching a phosphate to ADP in order to form ATP. And we're going to get about 34-ish ATP from that. So that's how the last step, the electron transport chain works. All right. Now I just want to do a bit of a summary diagram for you guys. Alrighty, so I'm going to draw it on there, then we will kind of discuss it. just want to get some of these parts up there first. So we have mitochondria. Let's see. We have The different parts are, first, over here we have glycolysis, over here is the Krebs cycle, 
and over here would be the electron transport chain. All right, excellent. Now, how this works is glucose enters, it goes through glycolysis, and that allows it to create two ATP as well as pyruvate. Now that pyruvate, with the help of coenzyme A, is going to enter the Krebs cycle. We'll get to that in a moment. We also make some electron carriers. So those are going to go all the way to the electron transport chain. They are the electron taxis. All right, so we go to the Krebs cycle. We end up making some carbon dioxide from the first pyruvate. We also make some carbon dioxide from the second pyruvate, giving us a total of six carbon dioxide molecules as our waste. We also make two ATP from it. All right, now at this point, we need the oxygen to enter. So six oxygen enters the carbon that, or sorry, the electron transport chain. Remember, they're going to pick up some of the hydrogen ion, the electrons, in order to create water. And that's going to be given off as a waste. Let's see. We also had the electron carriers that were generated from Krebs cycle coming up and entering the electron transport chain. So we have the electron carriers, we have the water, or sorry, the oxygen, and all of those go into the electron transport chain. What we get out of it is the um, water as a waste product and an additional give or take, sorry, 32, anywhere from 32 to 34. ATP. There's some debate as to how much it makes. The um, carriers, the now NAD plus, will go back to the Krebs cycle or to the cytoplasm for glycolysis in order to be reused again. All right, so that's just a generalized example or summary of it. I hope that this helped you out a little bit, um, but yeah. That's the basics of cell respiration. Uh, if you guys have any questions, hit me up in class or Google Classroom or email. But um, yeah, that's it. All right, you guys, take care of yourself. Stay awesome and safe.